Hello and welcome to today's ecology class. <clears throat> We're still in a section for behavior ecology and today we will talk about communication. My name is Divna, so let's start. As the title say, the communication is crucial for survival. The ability to communicate effectively with other individuals play a critical role in the lives of all the animals. Um, a robust definition of communication would be that it is a transfer on information from one or a group of animals to one or more other animals, which affects either the current or future behavior of their receivers. What this sentence actually means is that animals through communication provide information that other animals can incorporate into their decision making. Um, where we are examining how moth attract a mate or a ground squirrel convey information about a nearby predator or chimpanzee maintain position in a dominant hierarchy, in all these situations communicate systems are involved. The main currency in communication is the information. Uh, this information needs to be sent. So animals through time developed many different ways how to do that. And it all depends on the type of a signal the animal is sharing. So depending on that, communication means can be visual, acoustic, tactile or chemical. There are some uh, additional ones, but like um, electrical or some others, but these would can be considered as the four main ones. So for the side a visual signal, they are very effective for animals that are active during the day. Uh, some visual signals are permanent advertisements, for example the, the bright red epaulets of a male red winged blackbirds, you can see it here, it, it, its red parts are always displayed and this is very important for territory defense. Uh, alternatively some visual signals are actively produced by an individual only under appropriate conditions or only in a specific situation the animal decided it's the right time to express that kind of um, a signal. F so for the example of a male green anola which bob their head and extend a uh, brightly colored throat fan, the one you can see here, and it uses for signaling the territory ownership. And on the acoustical communication, we can say it's also exceedingly abundant in nature, likely because sound can adapt to a wide variety of environment conditions and also behavioral situations. So, sounds can vary substantially in amplitude or duration and frequency structure, all of which impact how far the sound will travel in the environment and how easily the receiver can localize the position of the sender. So, for example, we have um, passerine birds that emit pure tonal alarm calls that make localization difficult, while the same species produces more complex broadband made attraction songs that allow conspecifics to easily find the sender. And you can see in this picture, even though it looks complicated, it is just showing that the, with the different communication different parts of the brain are included in it and of course they have as a result the different types of, of uh, in this case vocalization signals so as we mentioned in, in the frequency and amplitude and so on so different different uh, species uh, have different strategies even though we are talking uh, about l vocalizing communication they all have different tactics like a subgroups of, of, of vocal communication. Nice example about the tactics, as I said, is uh, this particularly specialist form of, of acoustic communication that is present in, in bats and cetaceans, and they use high frequency sounds uh, to detect and localize prey. This actually works as a sonar, that's how it's called, so after the sound is emitted, uh, the returning echo is detected and processed and then ultimately it allows the animal to build a picture of their surrounding environment and make a very accurate assessment of a prey location so it works like a submarine sending uh, a wave and expecting the 
eco to come back so the sender receives it and process it as, as a picture for example bats are really accurate in assessing for example they can notice a 0 0.5 millimeter thick thread in the air amazing really T compared to the visual and acoustical models um, we also mentioned the chemical signals and they travel much more slowly through the environment since they must diffuse from the point source to of production uh, yet these signals can be transformed over long distances and fade slowly once once produced so for example in many moth species females produce chemicals Q and males follow the, the, the trail to the females location and, and researchers attempted to tease apart the role of visual and, and chemical signals in, in, in silk moth, the one you can see here, the white one. Uh, what they did is they gave males the choice between a female in a transparent box and a piece of filter paper soaked in the chemicals produ produced by a sexually receptive female. I inevitably males were drawn to the source of the chemical signals and did not respond to the sight of the isolated female so this means that in some species even though they are able of for example visual communication they are relying more to to the chemical chemical signals they are receiving also chemical communication play a critical role in the lives of other animals uh, some of which have a specialized vomeronasal organ that is used exclusively to detect chemical cues as for example it will be nose in, in our mammal case and here we will mention the case of an Asian elephant which uses its trunk or fancy said vomeronasal organ to process chemical cues in the female's urine and detect it if it, she's uh, sexually receptive um, the last ones are the tactile signals in which physical contact occurs between the sender and the receiver and can only be transmitted over a very short distance. Uh, the tactile communication is often very important in building and maintaining a relationship among social animals. And for example, chimpanzees that regularly groom other individuals are rewarded with a greater level of cooperation in food sharing. This also is important for developing a certain level of trust and relying on, on other animals for their survival. Now a bit uh, about mechanisms of uh, animal communication. So for the beginning we can define the animal that provides a signal is called a sender. The animal to which the signal is it directed to is called a receiver. Uh, the receiver uses the signal information to help make a decision. That's kind of general idea of a communication and its use. Uh, the signal could be used only if it can be interpreted or if the animal can understand it. That is why a species is limited to a certain way of communication and within and within in boundaries like frequency or, or color, th those kind of limitations also exist. Uh, the number of signals in a species repertoire could range from 5 to 6 in simple uh, non-social animals to 10 to 20 in social insects such as bees and ants, all the way up to 30 to 40 in social vertebrates such as vo wolves or, or primates. So, since Personal variations always exist, so there are some general communication ranges in a, in a population or a species, but every animal has a different voice color, different availability in frequency and so on, so basically, like in everything else, the per personal stamp is always present, and also circumstances in which a signal is sent, so even though if you have a completely same signal, it can be interpreted in different ways, depending on the receiver or sender or surrounding, you know, it all happen and so on. Uh, the association between alternative signals, for example, a sound of different frequencies, and, and in different alternative circumstances, for example, relative size of opponents, this is called a code.
quotes can be characterized as probabilities that a sender will emit a, a given signal in any given circumstance. In a perfect code, only one signal will be used in a given context, and only one context will be evoked that signal. In the reality, codes don't have to be perfect, but they need to be clear enough so the animal is sure that it is sending the right message, or actually that the receiver is receiving the exact message that the sender wanted to send. Animals differ widely in mechanisms by which they acquire signal codes, and some codes are inherited genetically, and others can be learned from the experience, even if it's a matter of sending or re receiving, interpreting given code. For example, to know if a uh, female is ready for mating, if the if you should be threatened by the other male, if you can hear it from uh, far away, how far the the sound source is, or how big is the center of a sound in the matter of of depth of the voice. So the the deeper the voice, the the bigger the the animal, and so on. These are the stuff that animals are born with or they learn by experience through their whole life. There are many functions of animal communication. However, some have been studied in more detail than others. And here we will talk about these. So firstly, communication during contest. In this case, animal communication plays a vital role in determining the winner of contest over a resource. Uh, many species have distinct signals that signal aggression or willingness to attack, or signals to convey retreat during competition over food, territories, or mates. Mating rituals are the specific situations in which animals produce signals to attract the attention of a possible mate or to solidify pair bonds. For example, a gazelle with assumed characteristics pose to initiate mating. Um, mating signals can also include the use of olfactory signals or calls unique to a species. Animals that form lasting pair bonds often have symmetrical display that they make to each other. A uh, famous example are the mutual presentations of reeds by great crested grapes studied by, by Mr. Huxley. And the, the triumph display shows by many species of geese and penguins on their nest site and the spectacular courtship displayed by birds of, of paradise. This is what we talked about in some previous presentations, if you remember. In the case of proclaiming territoriality, uh, males need to send a message to all the other males that they are dominant, so they need to emphasize their strength and, and body size and their fitness to females so there are certain types of communication that enable them to send this kind of message in a, in a food related signals many animals make them to attract a mate offspring or, or other member of a social group to a food source um, perhaps the most elaborate food related signal is the wedge dance of uh, honeybees of course Everybody knows for an ant example, which leaves a pheromone trail on the on the ground that can be followed by other ants to lead them to the food source. And see, there's a, uh, there is a well-known bee dance to explain the position of the food source. And then we have ants which use chemical communication for the same purpose. Alarm clocks, alarm calls communicate that the treat of a predator. So this allows the members of a social group to respond accordingly. This may include running for cover, becoming immobile, or getting into a group to reduce the risk of attack. Um, alarm signals are not always vocalizations. Crushed ants will release an alarm pheromone to attract more ants and send them into attack state. And then we have a uh, fish, for example, a small fish uh, schools, which you probably saw the movements of a school fish, how they move in a second, completely synchronized, and the communication is definitely involved in those kind of movements. 
which is to protect from the predator. And as a last thing, we have a meta communication. In this case, signals that will modify the meaning of subsequent signals are involved. For example, in the play phase of dogs, which signals that a subsequent aggressive signal is part of a play fight rather than a serious aggressive episode. So it's basically a cover cover face or a cover signal for something that actually is not how it can be interpreted in the first moment and it all depends of the uh, surrounding of the circumstances that the specific signal is emitted. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for the next presentations. Bye.